The title of this uh, talk is called Entrepreneurship, but to some degree it also might be called Antipreneurship, because in order to be an entrepreneur, you have to understand how not to be an antipreneur. So the, the barriers to innovation and technology are sort of the things that get in your way. And the first question I'd like to ask is, is anybody in this room dyslexic besides me? So the people that are dyslexic are really going to enjoy this. Because on the intelligence spectrum, if you thought of it as a yardstick from inch 1 to inch 36, the majority of humans on the planet have their intelligence measured in that 22 to 23 inch category, which is how good are you with the written word and number. And for dyslexics, we're, we're down like between inch one and three or between inches 32 and 36. So we don't find ourselves centering there. We find our way around the outside. We don't go in a straight line. And you're going to find that an important thought process in being an entrepreneur, which is straight lines can sometimes be uh, not very helpful. So disruptive technology thinking barriers to innovation. Technology is the result of a new thought that's been brought to bear on a problem. It gets there because it somehow survives the barriers that are normally in its way, the things that are in the way of being innovative. Conventional wisdom, this is simple. We all know what it is. Knowledge and beliefs, practices necessary to maintain the status quo. Okay? The world survives on conventional wisdom. Conventional wisdom is the boat in which we float. Without conventional wisdom, to a great degree, we're going to be bailing. But conventional wisdom has its limitations. And so for the purposes of this discussion, conventional wisdom is out. And the first thing that you have to do if you're going to think entrepreneurially, if you want your company to be entrepreneurial, and we're going to get into that, is you've got to be willing to take the first big step and say conventional wisdom is completely off the table for right now. I don't know, any of you recognize this picture? That's Hirohito, that's General MacArthur, and that's the surrender. That's what's in the picture. But if you guessed that for this morning presentation, you're wrong. That's Rupert Murdoch signing MySpace surrender papers to Facebook. Okay? <laughs> this is where conventional wisdom you take Rupert Murdoch paid a billion dollars for something that was losing $325 million a year, bought it, brought it in, tried to run it with conventional management, and it went upside down. While he was going upside down, Facebook not only got started, but stole the market because Facebook kept innovating and broke down the barriers, and they did not act conventionally. Disruptive thinking and technology. Okay. Disruptive thinking is the rejection of the status quo. It's the solicitation of novel, non-conventional, and radical ideas for success. But, I mean, just absorb that for a minute. Okay. Because the disruptive thought is the first thought on the way to change. Disruptive technology then becomes the act of applying new technology or the novel approach of old technology that changes and challenges the way a company does business. And so you can take all of this and put it into your personal life. It can be in sports, but it's, it's in, in business. If you don't apply this and find a way to get through it, you won't succeed. Entrepreneurial <coughs> success cannot exist without healthy, robust, disruptive thinking and technology. can happen. But, what is entrepreneurship? And I think this is the word that it's, you know, it became the 50 cent word, now it's the dime word or the dollar word. Everybody wants to talk about being entrepreneurial, entrepreneurship. For me, it's the science of transforming disruptive thinking and technology into innovative products. If you really want to just take everything else away from the stage and say, I want to be entrepreneurial, what are you really trying to do? You're trying to take that disruptive thought which you created into an innovative product, and you want to somehow cause that to become what I call common and ordinary in the marketplace. 
It needs to be transformational, like the wheel. And it can also be culturally shaping, like the internet. But think for a second about the wheel, all right? Let's all go back and we'll become cavemen and women sitting around a fire, okay? And the way we move stuff is we have a litter and we put it on the litter and we drag the litter, you know, and that's what we're used to doing. And the litter's pretty stable, it doesn't tip over, it's got two balance points in the back, and as long as your arms are strong, you can pull the litter. Well, some guy says, if you put a wheel on that, this round thing, okay, it'll be that much easier to pull. Well, one wheel is interesting, but it becomes really tippy. So you're pulling it along, but now it can go like that. So somebody says, put two wheels on it, All right? The disruptive barrier is everybody that looks at that and says, the wheels are gonna fall off, you gotta put grease in them. What happens if the wheel breaks? You're gonna be back to pulling the litter. Why bother to make all that stuff? Because you're just gonna try to pull the litter. So the, the wheel is really the first really disruptive piece of technology that came along. But if you think about all the people that were to poo poo the wheel because of the extra effort that was made, you have to make an axle, you got to figure out how to put some grease in it, it becomes very, very difficult. But it was transformational. But it was very, very disruptive thinking and it was very, very disruptive technology. Yet it changed the world forever. Disruptive thinking and technology in the white space. What's the white space? The white space is everything that isn't written down that you already have to work with. The white space is anti-conventional wisdom. The white space is the freedom that you have of everything that isn't already known. And whoever thinks that everything is already known wouldn't be here today. You wouldn't be getting up in the morning if you actually believed that everything that was possibly known was already discovered. Disruptive technology and thinking in the white space scares the pants off the status quo. If you're willing to be vocal and verbal and say, hey, that wheel is the, the way to go and everybody else in the room does it, you're gonna be looked at with a tremendous amount of skepticism. If you have a truly disruptive idea, if you have a truly disruptive piece of technology, people are gonna to wanna to get in your way because it affronts their sensibilities of what they already know. New knowledge is scary. New knowledge means, means you may have to work to adopt to it. Disruptive technology changes, challenges existing mindsets and products. It's not common and ordinary. This is my new favorite word, common and ordinary. I'm in a business now, we make the anti-oil product that runs just as well as oil, that is cheaper than oil, it's made locally, you can put it in your house, you can turn your thermostat. We make something, but it's not common and ordinary. HUD and FHA put out a statement that said for the Northeast of the United States, oil consumption is one of the number one impediment to the economy. That they need to find an alternative method of heating their homes and businesses without oil. This is our federal government. I wanted to jump up and down and say, that's great, that's terrific, it's, it's wonderful. That same agency has tens of millions of dollars to prime the pump for alternative energy. The Gilman Housing Project in northern Vermont has 300 applications for something other than oil. <clears throat> when they made their application a year ago to the FHA and HUD, they were denied. Because the technology that was gonna be employed was not common and ordinary. What's common and ordinary? An oil boiler which is exactly what they said they didn't want to put in place anymore. So if it's not common and ordinary, the system is stacked against it. We don't know what it is, we're not quite sure, and we're afraid of it. It's a lot of things that are disruptive require social change. I mean, the internet, Facebook, every, I mean, we, we live with that. Some of us resisted, some of us didn't. I'm happy to tell you that I don't have a Facebook page, okay? But the reason that I don't have a Facebook page is because I'm dyslexic and I don't really want to read it. <laughs> disruptive technology and disruptive thinking have no clear path to market initially. They're just these really fantastic ideas. They need to be, they need to find their way. And if you are looking at disruptive technology and thinking in the white space, you have to be willing to reject conventional wisdom to succeed. Because conventional wisdom is the antipreneurial part 
of entrepreneurship. Conventional wisdom will tell you you can't use the disruptive thinking and technology. Things you need to know. Um, first of all, the differences between your perceived model and the, what the market tells you needs to register. So the first step is that you're brilliant, you've got the best idea in the world, but the marketplace immediately is giving you some feedback and saying, no, no, you need to modify that. You will sink as an entrepreneur if you can't then be responsive to what the marketplace tells you. In order to do that, as an entrepreneur, you're going to have to be, and you already know how to that, do that, is you have to be able to change your mind in a split second. And you need to surround yourself with people that will allow you to do that. If you surround yourself by people who are entrepreneurial, they're going to tell you, no, 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 boss, you got a good idea, you can't change that. You have to trust yourself. At the same time that you have to listen to the marketplace, you have to reject anecdotal information. Because the thing that sinks most projects are that little anecdote of the two places where it won't work as opposed to the 98 places where it does work. And make sure that the people that are working with you don't change your mind for you. This used to be one of my favorite things when I was in the ski business, which is I would say, you know, you need to make snow starting from the top of the mountain to the bottom. And someone would say, no, but temperature inversions will make it at the bottom and then we'll make it at the top. And I found something very simple in the ski business. People did not like to get off the lift and walk down to the snow. <laughs> but if they got off the lift and they could ski two thirds of the way down, they were willing to walk down the rest of it. Entrepreneurial growth is dynamic. It, 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 it can be, I, you know, this is my parents speaking, but the word helter skelter, it, it, it kind of bumps all over the place. Having a plan to move from early adopters <coughs> to the early majority. Now, early adopters are the people that paid $60,000 for a $40,000 Prius. The early, and they're out there. So if you have a new product, there will be a set of early adopters. They're, in, they're important because they're going to they're gonna pay $60 for the $40,000 Prius, and they're going to allow you to stay in business for a couple of days. But once you get past the early adopters, the early majority, these people are the folks that we are, the, that's the heart of the market now, the beginning of the heart of the market. They want to pay $40,000, and like the woman in California, when it didn't get 50 miles to the gallon, the Honda that she bought, Civic, that didn't get 50, she went and sued and got $10,000, because the early majority actually wants it to do what you say it's going to do. If you think that the straightest, the fastest way between two points is a straight line, okay, you, you really better hope that the world is flat. It, it isn't. I mean, logically, we are trained to think that to get from A to B, we don't understand the quotient of time, and we don't understand the most important part of being about entrepreneurial is you get to skip stuff. And those people who are dyslexic learn very early in life that you can skip a whole bunch of stuff, go buy the cliff notes at the store, read those, and pick up the five or six keywords you need to fill out the multiple guest test. Managing yourself. Probably the hardest thing for someone that wants to be entrepreneurial or wants to be entrepreneurial inside their business is you are your most dangerous asset. You've got to learn to live in what we call the white space. And once you put yourself in the white space, you basically say, I'm against conventional wisdom. But remember, at the beginning of this, I said, conventional wisdom is what keeps the boat floating. So at some point, you have to understand that your innovation has to become conventional wisdom. Living in the white space means that you have to have a level head. You have to be willing to accept the fact that your innovative idea will only take you to the point where it's got to be adopted by the early majority. It's got to become common and ordinary. And your great idea, the wheel, needs grease fittings, needs a place where it can have its tires blown up, and may eventually need an engine to move it along. Be patient when things are moving slowly. But be relentless in speeding them up. Now that may sound like two different things, but you have to do that if you're going to be an entrepreneur. You really have to sort of be, things aren't going fast enough today. I can get into the middle of this process and really muck it up. Or I can go back in my office and I can figure out how to speed it up. Fight the urge to get si sidetracked. I think anybody that's truly entrepreneurial gets bored with their idea 
and wants to go on to the next thing. That's when the discipline comes in, that you've got to start fighting the urge to do something different. And finally, don't follow a straight line. Don't follow a straight line. How many of you in this room have ever tried something and not succeeded? Okay. Um, how many have tried something and not succeeded more than once? Ten times. Hundred. Okay, a couple honest people. Failure is a building block. Failure is death. Failure is important to the process. Can you guys see who this is? This is a picture of, of Thomas Edison. Okay. He failed to invent the light bulb a thousand times. He has a thousand positive data points, a thousand positive learning experience about how not to create. He said the light bulb. He said, I have not failed a thousand times. I have successfully discovered a thousand ways to not make a light bulb. <laughs> this is how the learning process actually takes place. There are very few people in the world who are smart enough to get it right the first time. When we measure people based on their ability to succeed without ever failing, we finally get somebody that we put into a position of power that has no understanding of how the rest of us got to where we are. In order to be successful, you have to taste failure. Failure is something that you need to absorb, embrace, say, yes, I give myself permission to fail, and I'm not going to be bothered by it. I like to talk to high school students because they're the ones that I think they're most impressionable about this thought process is give yourself permission to fail. Don't beat yourself up if you do. Then you can be rocky and get knocked down and stand back up again. Now let's get to the next part of this, which is the barriers to innovation. You know, this is funny, but to me, this is a, this is a, this is a real big one. Too much money destroys innovation. You have, an, you have a great idea, you want to innovate it, and the first thing is the managers come in and say, let's raise $10 million, $100 million, and put it inside this company. All of a sudden, the idea is buried in this giant managerial box that's been built for the idea to live in, and you've lost the ability to change the idea because the money basically said, well, you said you were going to get this done by then, so you've got to stay on that path. So although you need money, money can be the number one inhibitor to success. Patent and copyright protection, this is sort of like a, a political statement that I just sort of throw in here. Okay, The copyright and patent laws were written over 100 years ago. They are completely antiquated. They inhibit the ability to freely move information to be innovative. Yes, they protect an idea. But you can copy an idea, change it just slightly, and then try to take re-ownership of an old idea, and it goes on forever. And you truly can't have information and logic ideas that remain in the public domain that you can have access to to build off of. Most economic entities, when they put their money to work, they want some kind of insurance or they want a guarantee. And again, that gets back to the fact that some of the barriers to innovation are economically driven. If you're not ready to produce your product, even though it's your idea, your competition will. So as you take your product forward, remember that if you can't keep up with the market demand, you're going to get wiped out. In my own experience, there was a guy at Aspen, and by the way, I you know, plead guilty right now because I'm guilty of this, um, and very successfully guilty of it. There was a guy at Aspen that, that developed something called the s ski in the late 80s, early 90s. The S ski was really the first shaped ski. But ski technology had not advanced to the point where they knew how to make skis thick enough and resilient enough so they could put a big enough side cut in them so they weren't kind of like a marshmallow going down the hill. So the only time the S ski was any good was if you were in super soft powder, which we don't have any in New England, and it was fresh snow, and then you could make that turn. So we went out of business. <coughs> but a company called Alon decided to see whether they could make a stiff ski which they did, they couldn't find anybody to buy it. I happened to have skied on a pair of the old S ones, and I saw the Elan and tried that, and that was sort of the birth of shape skiing because it, it, it and I stole the idea. And 12 months later, I bought 10,000 pairs of skis from Rosenthal and stuck them across all the ski areas in New England, and magically, you know, two years later, they were common and ordinary because somebody had just taken them and stuck them out there. Entrenched interests, the super barrier. In government and business, mid-level bureaucrats and managers often hold opposing goals. Remember what I just told you about FHA and HUD? The administrators 
couldn't follow what the leaders were saying, couldn't get to common and ordinary, and a year later, the Gilman Housing Project still can't install their answer to not having oil leak. The government is trying to tell Gilman what they believe is common and ordinary. Gilman is the marketplace saying this is what we want to buy. They're stuck. Maybe that'll change. Recognize the politics. Who wants the status quo? Who wants to be open to change? This two blocks here, and I actually could be the third because I could talk about how something happens inside a university. Legislated status quo. These are the laws, the rules, the regulations, tax structures, political appointees, lobbyists that exist at the municipal level that are perhaps in the way of every political, governmental change that wants to take place. They exist at the municipal level. But wait, there's more. They exist at the state level. And yes, Billy Mays is here with you today. Yes, there's even more. They're at the federal level. And not only are they at each one of those levels, but they're in multiple places in those levels. So they're with the selectmen, and they're with the planning board, and they're with the Re Regional Development Council. That's three. At the state level, they're with the EPA. They're going to be in three or four different places at the state level. And we all know in the federal government, you know, they're all over the place. You get yes at the Department of Agriculture, and no at the Department of Energy, and yes at HUD. I mean, it's, it, it, it's gotten so complex that you can't get anything changed. We've legislated the status quo to stay where it is. So that's the battle that you're fighting in the government level. In the business arena, which is perhaps more akin to what we're talking about, we have fear, OK? Fear, barrier to innovation. Who's fear? Not yours, but everybody who's affronted by the fact that you're now going to put a wheel on a litter are afraid of you. You might be doing something that will make you better than they are. Customs. What's the local custom? We're, we've done it this way forever, OK? Now you want to do it differently? You're scaring people. Payoffs, OK? Business does it all the time. You buy a great product and put it on the shelf and throw it away. We started a, 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 a business that MasterCard and Bank of America buried. They spent $30 million to stop a company that I started from succeeding with Major League Bank, with Major League Baseball. I was backed by Chase, and in Major League Baseball, the other guys on the other side of the coin were backed by B of A. B of A was willing to spend $30 million to stop our product from coming to market. Barrett, it's still Barrett. It still hasn't come to market. Not in my backyard, people. OK, hey, wind farm, great. Okay, I don't want to see it. Sludge, that's my favorite word, new word now, sludge. Okay. <laughs> sludge is like all that stuff that you just can't. It's just there. It, it's, it's slow, it's sticky, it's this thing that stops the motor from running. You, know, you can't really describe what it is, but it's sludge. And greed, okay, it's huge. Somebody that wants to protect their own bankroll, doesn't want to let you have one, they're threatened by the self fact that someone else might be making money. Those are the things, along with envy, that are some of the biggest barriers to innovation. And they're all social in nature. They're all driven off of, I don't want you to succeed because I've succeeded. And they happen with your competitors, because it's in their best interest to, you know, as many of those things that your competitors can look at, because they want to stay on top, even if they haven't had a salient, sentient thought in a decade, they don't want you to succeed. I call them the skeptics, okay? That's everybody outside of the early adopter, early majority world that is going to be skeptical of anything that you can think of. It's just, they just get up every morning and they go, no, nah, that can't possibly happen. No, no way Rick Santorum can possibly win a primary. And then, the ancients, okay? And you can all put whatever definition you want about the ancients, but the ancients are basically the people that we've always done it this way. There's no really good reason to change. A disruptive thought. And I don't know, anybody want to tell me what it is? They, this is just a line. I don't know if you can see it. It's a, this is the life cycle of a product. So, I mean, pretty easily, you're starting, you start at the beginning of the idea, and you rise the curve, and you run, it, you run it out for however long it is, and then you go into a decline, and the decline becomes pretty steep. In the life cycle of a product, 
A certain amount of time you're in the green and you're making money, and a certain amount of time you're in the red and you're losing money. A disruptive thought is what's running the company as it rises. When you, when you're going from the original thought, the point of profitability, people are running. There's always somebody that you need to hire to fill a job that hasn't been filled yet. You're right on the edge. Everybody's energized. And the next thing that you do when you finally get past the point that you're making money is somebody comes along and says, we need to manage this thing. We got to get a hold of this. And now we got to be, we got to have quarterly results. We've got to be predictable. We've got to get our inventory in line. We've got to have our marketing plans in line. And then the company runs on this profitable line, which is up a little, down a little, up a little, down a little. And senior management is in there running the company, making sure that it stays profitable. That's their job. We got over the hump. Now we need to stay there. At some point, it becomes management becomes corrosive because management needs to keep the company profitable and doesn't want to take any risks, doesn't want to allow any challenges that could possibly get in the way of keeping that nice squiggly line in the profitable area going. Somewhere in this, you've got to have a new idea. Something has to happen that becomes innovative, that revitalizes the company at a point when things are going along just fine. When things are going along just fine is when you really need to start thinking about what you're going to be doing next and why aren't you already doing it. One of the best modern day examples of that is the digital camera. The digital camera was invented not by Sony, not by Nikon, not by Hewlett Packard, is invented by Kodak. Right there, Kodak invented the digital camera. And Kodak said, that is going to get in the way of our profit line. We will be feeding from ourselves. And they buried it. And they took it, and they shoved it down, and the rest of the world finally got a hold of it. Kodak is gone. They don't make film anymore, but they were there first. They squashed that technology. The life cycle of a product has to fight through those barriers to innovation, has to allow for new innovation, has to allow for new thinking. So at the end of the day, the question is, who will you be? How will you take this forward? What will you do with it? I used to say, who blows your skirt up? But I've been told that that's politically, politically incorrect. <laughs> So it's what, what excites you. The message is to disrupt and innovate. I have personal experiences that many of you have about this. I'm at a crossroads with a company that I've invested in, which has exactly this problem. I'm on a board. I own 10% of the company. It installed some really strong management. And it's now not capable of innovating. And I have the same challenge that many of you have, which is I've got knowledge and I've got understanding, but I've got to figure out how to not scare the bejesus out of all the people that I work with and explain we are not going to succeed unless we get past the barriers, unless we get disruptive in our thinking, and unless we allow ourselves to succeed. The shape ski is a great example of how an industry changed. I didn't invent the shape ski. It wasn't my idea. I took over at the point where I saw that there was something that I could innovate and push into the marketplace. If I look again at the east of the United States, we've got about 11 and a half million homes in the northeast part of the United States that heat with number two heating oil. We have a really odd situation for those of us that are <coughs> students of the economy. Samuelson, Keynesian, Friedman, none of that history is applicable now to energy. Because the people that own the oil aren't selling us the oil based on anything other than their need for money. 
I think it costs Saudi Arabia about $80 a barrel to keep their standard of living where it is, balance their budget. Russia needs about 100 to balance their budget. Qatar, Dubai, Kuwait, they need about $100 a barrel to maintain the $250,000 that they give to all their citizens so they can all buy Bentleys. In order for that to continue, what has to happen is the price gets high enough, we get scared, so we decide that we're going to use less oil. And we start to conserve. So we're actually, congratulations to everybody in the room, we as a country are using proportionally less oil now than we were. Problem is that when we use 10% less, they need to charge us 10% more. Otherwise, they go out of business. You can't blame the Texas oil man for selling his oil at $100 a barrel if the world price is being set by OPEC at $100 a barrel. I mean, I love my country, but the price is $100. You know, maybe I'll tithe a little bit uh, you know, to my church. But I still want to get the, the market price. So we're in a situation globally now where even conserving <coughs> is not going to be helpful. The only thing that's going to be helpful in the long run is to switch to a fuel of some kind that they don't control. And then we can get back to supply and demand. In the short term, we're going to have to pay more for the fuel that we use. But we won't be subject to the whims of somebody else constantly changing the price. So wind energy is great, maybe more expensive right now, but long term, it's dependable and it's ours, and we're not going to have to worry about a variable cost. Those of you who are in business, one of the things that we hate the most is costs that we can't predict. That's you know conventional wisdom. We're back into actually running the company now and being slightly managerial, but I don't want to have to worry about the continuing change of the price of, of fuel. So if you want to look at the future of New England, you're going to say to yourself, there's 11 and a half million people that really shouldn't be using oil. I believe that. So the disruptive thought was to tell you all what you need to do is burn the trees in your backyard. Because I now sell products that use trees. Not really innovative because we've been heating with trees forever. But what's innovative is that you probably didn't know that if you take a tree, grind it up and put it back together again, instead of getting pollution and about 25% of the energy out of it, you can get 90% of the energy out of it and not pollute at all. It's just a hydrocarbon. Okay. And the cleaner you burn it and the higher the temperature that you burn it, the cleaner the burn is going to be. And so the tree is like a solar battery. It's going to keep growing. And the more you harvest trees intelligently, the faster you can get them to grow. In the state of Maine, we used to get about 0.25 cords per acre off of an acre of land. Now, with sustainable harvesting practices, you get about 0.37 acre of cords per acre. And they look like you're going to get almost a half a cord per acre. But that's because you're farming the land. Now, you don't want to cut down all the trees next to the brook. But it's like a huge farm when you look at the landscape of the Northeast. There's a lot of wood that we can use. We can also specialize and grow products for fuel. And not like corn, but you can grow switch grass and elephant grass and with Kansas grass on the fields that are going fallow where we don't grow potatoes anymore. And you can grow the fuel that can be used. And all these things can be done at either half or less than half the price that you're currently paying for oil. So why wouldn't you do it? It makes sense. You just turn the thermostat. But it's not common and ordinary. It's, it, you're not used to it. Smitty that delivers your oil to your house every day isn't delivering your house. Again. A different guy in a really odd looking truck is showing up and instead of pouring liquid into your house, he's blowing a fuel into your house. And your neighbor doesn't have one and so you're going to be the early adopter or the early majority and so you've got to fit into that category. As the price of oil continues to creep up and be more volatile, we're going to continue to look for answers. So. I'm again at the age of 62 living what I preach, which is I got a great product. I've had all the problems. It's not common and ordinary. I got the US government in my way. 
I have every state agency in New England, every environmental agency in New England telling me that my product couldn't be sold because it was an outdoor wood boiler. And was trying to get approved. It takes years of going through EPA and testing and say, look, my thing is cleaner, okay, than the oil thing that's in the guy's house right there. And to become common and ordinary is a constant struggle. You've got to continue to disrupt and challenge people's thinking. And then at the end of the day, you have to be willing for somebody else to take credit. I fully accept the fact that Senator Snow or Senator Collins in the state of Maine will take credit for the fact that you can finally buy a boiler in northern Vermont in the Gilliman Housing Trust that's common and ordinary. Because they're going to take credit for finally getting the people that are running these departments to say that the laws that they pass, the money they want to spend, can actually be spent the way it was meant to be spent. And that's great. And I hope they have the headline. I only hope that I get to sell the product. But each of you has this ability to take a look back in your own company and go back to, back to this slide and say, where am I in that life cycle right now? All right? It's a, not a comfortable thought because, you know, you're driving a nice car, apparently. I drive it. Jeep with 170,000 miles on it, so I know I wasn't talking about me. But some of you are driving nice cars, it's comfortable, all right? You want to continue to do that, but you, you, you know, you're running the risk that with the changing world, with everything that's going on, what you now think is common and ordinary needs to be disruptive and needs to have a new thought. And that's your challenge. And if you're in business, you have to try to figure out how to become entrepreneurial inside your own company without scaring everybody, without creating fear, without creating all the negatives. That's your challenge. Now, if I can tempt you, and I don't know whether I'll be back next year or not, but the second follow-on to this, which is essentially I buy into this disruptive thing, but I've got no idea how to make it work inside my company. And if you're all intrigued with this, we've thought a lot about it. And I've taken a little bit of time to be reflective because I'm, you know, at 62, you're allowed to collect Social Security, which means you're also allowed to think about things that you wouldn't think about when you're 42. I started to think about what it was that I was actually doing and still do when I come up with an innovative thought that I want to incubate. And I want to do it. You know, I want to give people permission to fail and a bunch of other things in there. So the step two is to try to figure out how to take disruptive technology innovation and figure out how to embrace it and allow it to happen inside your existing environment without destroying your company, because that's what your fear is. Your fear, the greatest fear that you have is that your disruptive thought, your disruptive technology is going to prematurely take you and kill you. It's going to make you corrosive. When in actual fact, that point in which you actually need to get it started is now. You're all glued onto my every word, which I think is really great. Um, I'm totally full of it, and I made this up this morning. <laughs> I put this slideshow together last night. But what I'd like to do is, is challenge you now to any anecdote that you personally have, or ask me any question that you want about anything that I've stumbled with. I mean, there's not a lot of times in your life where somebody that basically made a half a billion dollars and managed to lose 90% of it is standing in front of you. So I had some learning along the way. And I'm happy to share that, share that learning, or let you share your knowledge or your thoughts about what we're talking about this morning. Based on personal experience, disruptive thought and behavior in the workplace is rewarded. I agree. That's a that's a very interesting thought. Okay, so all right, take your ego hat off for a minute, okay, and and say instead, I got lucky and succeeded inside my company with my idea. I may not be the smartest person inside this company. How do I allow the disruptive thought and the innovative thought <coughs> inside my company to succeed? Anybody have any ideas? 
It's the first thing that you have to think about when somebody else has a good idea is they're sitting there with the good idea. They're going to say, what's in it for me? Talk about, let's talk about a new idea for a minute. You have a new idea. What's the first thing that happens to you when you have a new idea? Like, what can I do with it? Probably don't have a new idea and say, I'm now going to save the world. Okay? You know, there's a lot of, you can be esoteric, but you have to be honest, which is human nature. And the first thing is you're going to say, what's in it for me? So, to answer that in another way is saying, first thing is, you know, I'm a little greedy sometimes. Can it make money? Can an idea make money? Or if I was in a hospital setting, it can save a life. Or if I'm in an educational setting, will it create another new idea that can be fostered? But if in a purely business sense, I think the first question I'm going to ask is, is it going to cost money or is it going to make me money? And if it's going to make me money, is it going to make me a lot of money? And then if it's going to make me a lot of money, is it going to make a disgustingly large amount of money? And then is it going to make such a large amount of money that I absolutely have to try this because that's the only reason I'll ever do anything is that I can do something that makes a lot of money. Now, you've got to understand that somebody inside your company is going to ask the question, if they have a great idea, what's in it for me? If you don't have a system of rewarding someone for coming up with a good idea and being willing to raise their hand and then be shot, you have 100 employees, one employee has a new idea, 99 are going to want to shoot that guy because he's disruptive, he's innovative. You know, she is now challenging my authority, holding mackerel, I'm the manager, what do I do? So each business is going to be different, but that's a great point. How do you reward that? Yeah, I've got a question. So sounds like a little bit of what we're talking about here is disruptive thought within an existing organization. So what about disruptive thought to the marketplace that is outside of an existing organization? What would you work? For example? Well, I started a company in 2009 with consulting services. We've been successful, but I came up with another idea, which is a product company. It's just <coughs> my belief based on our research so far. However, it's going to require, you know, funding, the right talent. Team. So, you know, um, obviously the incubator concept has got, you know, validity, but is there something else in terms of validating or bringing a disruptive thought to the marketplace when the company doesn't might yet exist? I mean, I mean, at the end of the day, we all suffer from the same stumbling blocks. We have great ideas, and, you know, What's in it for me? Is the idea strong enough for me to get off my chair and, and challenge myself with it? I mean, I, I dislike government so much, I actually ran for office to try to be the governor of the state of Maine. Because I think the biggest thing that gets in the way that I witness every day are the barriers that come from government to business innovation. And they're, they're ridiculous. And, and I think I lost, OK? I failed to become. Governor, I, I learned a great lesson. I now understand almost every barrier that exists in my marketplace. And I learned a lot of them because I, I put myself out there and I lost. I, I really believe that that whole concept of being willing to fail is the key. So if I can conclude with one more thought to finalize, just to, to put a punctuation point on this, there's no monopoly on thought. The white space is available to anybody that wants to go into the white space. It, 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 it's painless. It doesn't feel like it initially. But allowing yourself to go into the white space is painless. And look around there. And when you find something that you think might be cool or might make a difference to your business or might make a difference to your product, and you can and you work at home as well, don't be fearful about trying it. You've got to get over that barrier that somehow you're going to be punished for failing. If you think about the wonderful world that a dyslexic lives in, okay? in order for a dyslexic to be successful, a dyslexic basically has to say, the entire way that you've decided to measure my intelligence okay, is irrelevant to me. You decided you wanted to measure my intelligence, my ability to comprehend and mimic back to you what I'm supposed to, supposed to read on a page of paper. And if I read 700 pages over the course of the course, I'll get all the information. 
The dyslexic learns that they never have to open the book to succeed. They don't do good with printed symbols on paper. They're, they don't process that really well. But they may have significant auditory skills. And with those auditory skills, all they have to do is listen, and they'll get the, they'll, they'll get the answer. They'll know what to do. You have to trust the fact that if you're going to be in the white space, you're not going to be reading the textbook. You're going to be reading everything that isn't written in the textbook. And you're going to be thinking about everything that hasn't been thought of in the textbook. And you're going to find your own wormhole. Believe in wormholes. You're going to find your own wormhole to success. It's not going to be a straight line. It's going to be some function of allowing you to skip over things that everybody else is dwelling on. Now, where are the dyslexic? This is really the good part. Where the dyslexic can eventually learn how to read and probably read well. The dyslexic has learned that there are parts of their brain that they need to pull into focus to be common and ordinary like the rest of you. Well, I can't exist in a world that doesn't have PowerPoint and printed words, and I have to read stuff every day, and I, I read constantly. But I'm using, according to the studies, a whole different part of my brain. Well, here's the really good news. That society has told you that your intelligence is being measured on what you learned in high school and college and could reiterate on a test paper. Congratulations for those of you who did well. That proves that you have a great ability in that one segment of that 36-inch ruler. But you also have all the same abilities that you haven't tried yet. If you haven't played in the white space yet, learn how to do it. Allow yourself to fail with some ideas that you haven't brought forward yet. You're not limited. You just haven't been there. Just It's the Super Bowl of, of life. You've been living between the 49-yard line and playing the game in there. Play in the end zones a little bit. It's scary when you get into the red zone. The guys that the women in the room that love football, when you get into the red zone, the whole game changes. You know, what you do to get from the 50 to the 20 is one thing. What you get to get from the 20 to the one-yard line is something different. And what's entirely different, because you know, it's probably only three minutes of the game of, a, of that 60 minute game that's involved with actually the scoring part. It means 57 minutes are between the lines, three minutes are in the white space. The broken play that gets turned into a win. Give yourself permission to fail, give yourself permission to play in the white space. And with that, Dr. Galvin.